Hello, everyone. This is your host, Akil Jabbar, and welcome back to another episode of SaaS District. In today's episode, we'll be talking about growing a 150 plus SaaS sales team from zero to 51 million ARR in just four years. Today, we have our guest, Justin Welsh, joining us. Justin is a revenue operator, executive mentor, and SMB SaaS advisor with over 10 years of revenue leadership experience. He helps founders to drive scalable growth past 50 million in recurring revenue. And most recently, Justin led Patient Pop from $0 to 51 million in recurring revenue and built the sales organization from one to 150 plus people in the four years. He specializes in SMB SaaS sales and the go-to-mark strategy for SMB SaaS products, where he figures out the best way to sell them, who to sell it to, and how much to sell it for. He basically partners with early stage founders to craft the sales story and achieve scale. Uh, he left his full-time executive role at Patient Pop to open his boutique advisory company located in Nashville. And Justin also co-founded an investment firm called the Shelby, Shelby Project with his wife, where they help tiny entrepreneurs thrive and where all investments are made from their own personal capital. Outside of work, he loves spending time with his wife, hiking, reading, playing with his three dogs, drinking craft beer, and trink- tinkering with new ideas. <laughs> so welcome, Justin. Super excited to have you on our show today. Hopefully that was a good introduction. That was great. Gil, thanks for uh, for the nice introduction, and it's great to be here, man. No worries. So uh, I always like to start the episode. Uh, if you could just share a little bit for the people who don't know you, uh, share a little bit about your background and your early ventures that led you to where you are today. Sure. So um, I came out of school in 2003. And for the first really six years of my career, um, I would be considered what you might call very unsuccessful. Um, you know, I was really sort of immature when I came out of school. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. My dad had been a salesman for 40 years at that time. So, you know, we had a nice house and a couple of cars. And I thought, you know, that would sort of be it. So I got into sales, much like him, in pharmaceutical sales. And for some reason, I just wasn't ready for the professional world. And you know, I, I actually got fired in my, my first three jobs. And so um, by the time 2009 rolled around, I had been in the, you know, I, had, I was six years in my career and I had zero success. And um, luckily, right, and there's an element of luck here. Um, I had my resume on monster.com and a guy by the name of Cyrus Masumi saw it in New York. I was living in Allentown, Pennsylvania at that time. And he asked if I wanted to come to New York City and interview for uh, a role at a company called ZocDoc, which was just nine people deep in New York at that time. And I, so I went there and I interviewed. And long story short, um, that was sort of a turning point in my career. I ended up with this really incredible group of people selling this product that I, was, I bought into so much that I was so passionate about in this city that had so much energy. And at the same time, I was maturing. And so these four things are kind of what I would call an intersection of, of those four. And I became really excellent at selling that product almost overnight. And for the next five years, I would get promoted multiple times. I was moved across the country a bunch of times to open new markets, um, save failing markets. And then eventually I reported to the CEO, Cyrus, who had hired me originally. About four years later, I reported to him building uh, the second revenue stream for that company. Um, and then I was there for about a total of five years. And after that, um, I was hired on as the VP of sales at a company called Patient Pop. And they were just six people deep. So I've been a sub 10 employee now, now two times. And I was the VP of sales of one person. And uh, he had worked for me at ZocDoc. And for some reason, like that business was the perfect fit for me. And I think it was because same selling cycle, same average contract value, same customer profile. And, um, you know, I thought I'd be there to maybe two, three, four million, and they'd go hire somebody who is much more experienced than me. But uh, we went uh, to about 51 million in four and a half years. And that was an amazing run, built a team to over 150 people. And uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, in August of last year, I stepped away to open my boutique advisory firm. Very cool. So I, I love that because you know you, you say you had a lot of you know failures across the way, but then it was just like it wasn't that you were a failure. It was just right time, right place, right opportunity that where you could thrive, and that's where you did right. You just were in the right place that you could, yeah, with the right people around you. That's awesome. <laughs> totally. I think I think a lot of people don't know what they want to do, right? I think that's a <clears throat> pretty common, right? And I think that because people don't know what they want to do, they end up selling or marketing or customer, you know, acting as customer success for a business they just don't care about. And I think that um, people get stuck in that cycle for a long time. And I think for me, the change was just finding something that I truly and deeply cared about, was was heavily passionate about. That that to me made all the difference in the world for my career personally. 
Nice. And then when you joined P- Patient Pop at that point, uh, you know, VP of sales, managing one person, can you share a little bit, you know, getting right into it? What were the, the root factors? What were the strategies you were implementing that helped you lead that success from the zero to 51 and then the, the, the sales team expansion? Yeah, I think there were a couple. I think the first was I very quickly did something that I knew. And this will sound really antiquated given that now it's almost 2021 and this was back in early 2015 and it was still antiquated then. Um, but I hired a couple of field salespeople, which okay. is like, whoa, we were at a $6,000 ACV like field sales. That's crazy. But I knew that market. I had, I had been a field salesperson. I had hired really successful field salespeople. I knew that you know, talking to your customers in person was a great opportunity to interact with them, learn from them, get the product into their hands, see what works, see what didn't. So the first thing is I just did something that I knew. And that was, that was field sales. Um, the second thing is uh, I think a lot of early sales leaders are the very first time they're really in a big executive position. Um, they, they think that they know the right answer. And so they put all their eggs in one basket and they plow forward. And I think that's why there's a short tenure for VPs of sales around 16 months. For me, I run everything hypothesis based. So I never, you know, spent money or time doing something unless we had experimented with it first. So I think we, we did a really good job of constantly running small experiments, tracking our results, interpreting the data, iterating, rerunning, reinterpreting, and then installing if it worked. If it didn't work, we knew, we knew generally if we were failing, we would fail fast and then we would keep going. And so we constantly tried new things and that did a few things. It improved win rates, it reduced expenses, it made us more efficient. And so I think those were two really key things that we did early on to, to be successful. And in the very early stages where you had very limited people, maybe limited budget at the time, what were some of those early experiences? Were you hiring like, you know, three sales reps or, you know, field sales guys at a time? Was it 10 or was it one? And then, you know, slowly building up one at every month or a few months from there? Yeah, we, we generally hired in groups of two. two. Um, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to make sure that um, we always had a peer partner when we hired someone. So someone to compete against, someone to learn with. Um, that to me was really important. I think coming in on an island is really challenging. And I think going out and hiring 10 people at once, it, it causes the sort of bow to break when you're really small. If you try and train up 10 people at once, manage all those people effectively when you don't have a very big team, that's challenging. So we went, we grew, you know, in the beginning very methodically and very, mm. very in small increments. And I think that was the right thing to do. I, I don't think I would have done it differently if I could go back and do that. Um, because I didn't want to, um, you know, constrain the, the limited resources that we had. Makes sense. And then, you know, 2019, you know, you grew to a 51 million ARR. What was your motivation? What was your reason at the time, uh, you know, to leave and start your own boutique advisory firm? And then how do you apply that similar sales strategy or playbook that you learned there to help consult other businesses who are obviously early stage SMB SaaS founders? Yeah, I think, you know, the reason that I left is, is sort of, there's two, two components. Um, one was ZocDoc was a really hard place to work. And I say that in a very good way. I loved working there, but it was, you know, we worked hard. Um, and then at patient pop, I brought a similar mentality into that organization. And so it was another five years, of you know, working really hard and a lot of stress, you know, my very first executive role. So after 10 years, um, both physically and mentally, you could see it and I could feel it. And when I looked in the mirror, I could tell that, you know, it was grinding me down and, I think the first thing that I wanted was just a break. I wanted to pull back. I was, you know, 38 or 37 when I walked away, pull back um, and and kind of get my ducks in a row again before potentially putting myself back out there. So one was just burnout, right? Just classic burnout. Um, the, second, the second one was, <laughs> this may sound funny, but like almost like a midlife realization of what's important. It's like, you know, spending more time with my wife, things like that. And so um, I thought to myself, how could I earn a good living? How could I make an impact? How could I enjoy my time and still control my own my own time for the most part? And so to me, that was providing advice to companies that were going through the same things that I had gone through the previous 10 years. And the way that I the way that I bring that that to these companies is much in the way that I described earlier. I think if you if you've spent your time with lots of salespeople before, there is a cliche that salespeople are aggressive and um, you know, a little forth, you know, forthright. And that's true especially folks who have done a really good job at building sales organizations. They come in as consultants and they say like, I've got it. I know the answer to all this. I've got the answer to all your problems. Just get out of my way and let me do it. That's not what I do. So I use that same hypothesis-based approach when I work with my customers. Meaning I walk in with 
with good knowledge and good experience, but I assume that I know nothing about their business, their customer, their industry, and I just start learning. And the first thing that I do is once I've learned, I start making some guesses and some assumptions. Where do I think this business can get better? Why do I think that? What are the metrics that we're going to measure? And then we put in small experiments and, and you know, the, the founders generally report back to me with their learnings. And then we make, we make changes based on that. So it's very similar to my early approach at Patient Pop. So very similar to like a growth marketing strategy, right? Where you just, you keep iterating and finding, you do a couple of tests and then one will just pick off and you keep doubling down on it, right? Um, so obviously these SaaS founders are coming to you because there's something maybe wrong or inefficient in their sales process or they just don't have one. Um, but when you go in and, and look at this as an as a, as a outsider, what are you seeing as typical like big mistakes that you come in um, when working with these founders? Yeah, I would say the first is just a lack of understanding of the most efficient way to go to market. So oftentimes I'll come into a business and they've raised some capital, maybe they've raised a, an A round, and I'll I'll dig into their you know their their average contract value. And sometimes the founders will come back and say, oh, we sell a you know it's a hundred dollar a month product and it's twelve hundred dollars across one year. And they're starting to go out and hire a combination of SDR and AE. And I'm I'm just sitting back thinking, you know, in my experience, the closer you can drive to $10,000 average contract value makes specialization affordable, or at least much better on the unit economic side of the business. You can't go out and hire an SDR team and an AE team with a $100 a month product. It's just not the right way to go to market. So a lot of it's just like things I've seen before and, and understand how to, how to break apart. I think the other one is they don't necessarily understand the sales development piece that well. They make a lot of they make a lot of assumptions based on talking to peers or other founders. So, you know, let me give you an example, Akil. I'll talk sure. to a founder who will say, I'm gonna hire an SDR and I think that they should be able to schedule four or five meetings a day. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you read all the data, the average SMB SAS SDR schedules 20 meetings a month or 18 and 12 or 13 of them show up. So they're expecting 70 or 80 meetings a month. Their expectations are off. And so they build a model with these wild expectations and it looks great to investors and it looks great to their finance folks, but it's just unrealistic. And so I get in there and sort of set the pieces straight based on experience and, and, and set their expectations to be more aligned with what they should be. So that's, that's often a starting point for me. Makes sense. And then can, can you clarify a little bit more? So you mentioned, you know, 6K ACV is kind of what you work with. You know, anything like 100, 100 a month, it doesn't make sense. But with your playbook specifically, what, what kind of SaaS companies are you seeing, uh, you know, effectively applying your, sale, your playbook, you're, you know, getting best results yeah. when you're involved? Is it, you know, product market fit? Is it the industry, uh, the target audience? Like, what's your ideal, you know, customer you want to work with and, and totally. drive results? Yeah. I, I niche pretty well. I work with early stage SMB SaaS companies in the healthcare technology vertical. Okay. So I, I'm very niche. I don't generally take on clients that are outside of healthcare. Um, mm -hmm. I generally don't take clients that are selling a 50K or 100K product. I'm usually 30K or below. I okay. sell in a trend. I usually take on clients that are very transactional, so have a fast velocity in their sales motion. And I generally don't take on clients that are past the Series B. So okay. that that gives me a very small niche, but I like to think that if you look at my experience, that my experience speaks volumes about my ability to have an impact in that niche and to mm. be one of the the more well experienced and, and excuse me, uh, having more experience and having driven more results for companies in that very specific niche. So my strategies are, you know, if you've got a ten to fifteen or twenty k ACV and you've got a two to four week sales cycle and you're in the healthcare space, that that's my sweet spot. And why would you stick to healthcare space? I understand you've worked in that space and you're familiar with like, you know, the wording and how to approach those, those target audience. Would, would that not apply to other industries like marketing tech, education tech? It, do, it does. It does apply. Mm. I think for me, my, my goal is in my retainer program, which is where how advisors sign on to, to have me as an, uh, how, excuse me, how entrepreneurs sign on to have me as an advisor over the course of time. My goal is to help them make an immediate impact and okay. to get their get their ship set on the right course as fast as possible using very, very relevant learnings. And sure, I think some of my learnings might apply well to the legal space or the auto space or the ed tech space, things like that. But having to learn the different personas and players to me is just uh, p perhaps um, a slower pace towards getting results. And since I've played in this space for 16 years, I feel like this gives me the best opportunity to plug in understand the customer, the jargon, the industry, 
all the players and really make an impact quickly. And so based on that, I can choose customers that I know are going to have massive success working with me, which is the way that I want to build my business. Makes sense. And I guess that also avoids like frustration from all sides, right? If you're still trying to figure out and you don't get the result versus you come in, you feel good. I know what I'm doing. No, at, at, to some level and, and you feel comfortable with that. Definitely. Um, yeah. So we've seen a little bit of mixed results. I'm talking about a little bit on the on the go-to-market strategy. I know some founders and teams really focus on product-led, where they just focus all their energy and efforts on the, on the product itself. Um, and we've seen that benefits, you know, how they perform in this space. What is your strategy or playbook when it comes to the go-to-market strategy? Are you... Are you working with companies who are, are product led or do you only focus on, on the sales side? And Yeah, I mean, so I think it's important that all companies are product led. Like, let me just be very clear that I think you can, you can spin up a sales and marketing engine that is quite phenomenal with a very crappy product and the results mm-hmm. will almost always be the same. You'll sell a lot and you'll churn a lot, right? So to me, the lifetime value of a customer, yes, it depends on customer success and implementation and onboarding, but it really depends on the stickiness and the value of the product. And mm-hmm. so I mm-hmm. believe that founders should be product-led. And if they're not product-led, then somebody on their team should be in charge of making sure that the product is the number one priority. Build a great product and you'll get great customers if you have a good sales and marketing engine. And if the product is great, the customers will stick around. So what I try and do is partner with those product-led founders and really help educate them if they come from the product side on distribution. Because mm-hmm. a great product with no distribution is also really challenging, right? And so um, I partner with those folks and I think through their go-to-market on the revenue side. And the, my sort of go-to for go-to-market is I think about intent first. So mm-hmm. oftentimes when I partner with a founder, the first thing I want to understand is if there's intent in the marketplace. Are, are, is the end user raising their hand online and looking for a product like this? Do they know how to search for it? Is that volume there? And if so, I'm always a marketing before sales type of sales mm-hmm. leader. I would love to say sales above everything else, but it's just simply not true. If you mm-hmm. have intent, if you have intent in your business or in your industry or with your customer base, then I like to usually bring in a marketing peer that I trust really well to start generating qualified leads. And I will Mm -hmm. staff up the sales team accordingly. Now, Mm -hmm. if there's no intent in the market or people don't know how to search for it, or, you know, there's not a whole lot of keyword volume, then based on the ACV, I would consider going outbound. So we have to go out and actually educate the market that this exists. So those are my two most common go to markets early stage. And then I layer in things like strategic partners and channel relations. Makes sense. I think you kind of may have kind of answered this question, but you know, every, you know, different set SaaS companies, maybe just for a general kind of public, have different sales cycle, even though you're, you like that two to four weeks, you know, based on the target, the market, you know, you name it. How, how do you get a measurable and comfortable sales cycle aligned between, you know, the consulting service you provide, the company expectations, and then also the, the end user expectations all across? Yeah. So there are generally, like, in my opinion, a few different pieces that either slow down or speed up the sales cycle. So the first thing that I do, because I'm really niche, is I generally have an assumption of how long a sales cycle should be. So when a founder comes to me and says, we're selling to doctors, we're selling a 10K product, and we have a two-month sales cycle, that to me is a warning sign. I'm thinking that sales cycle should be closer to two weeks. And so the very first thing that I want to do is I want to break down the different like very granular pieces of the sales process that usually elongate the sales cycle. So things like how fast are we setting meetings, right? Like how quickly is that first meeting happening? At the outset of the first meeting, how are the next steps and expectations set by the salesperson, right? How is marketing supporting them? How are we introducing implementation? There are so many different things that can shorten the sales cycle. And so I start to look across that process in in that architecture and start to pick them off one by one. I usually start in the in the pre-sales funnel. Like, is the messaging right? Are we setting the right expectations for how to buy this? Do customers understand what they're getting into when they show up for their, their demonstration? Then I, I look at the, the sales development team. What's the messaging like? How are they setting the expectations? How quickly are they getting this person to the account executive? Then I look at the account executives. Are they closing the deal in the beginning of the call? Meaning, are they closing for next steps early so that they understand how to move the customer through the process? Those are all these uh, sort of marks along the sales cycle that companies miss. And when you do that, you elongate that sales cycle. When I came into patient pop, even with that one rep, it was 21 days. And by the time I left, we had it down to 8.6. So we had cut that wow. you know, by more than more than half. <laughs> That's huge. Do you, quick question. Do you have a, uh, a ratio that you like to work with when building sales team, like an AE to BDR ratio? I've heard two to one, three to one, five to one. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think I think it depends. Like, I think it depends on what your average contract value is and how many uh, qualified opportunities a BDR can generate for an account executive. Mm. Mine is usually between one to one and two to one. So I, I don't mean okay. to cop out and say one and a half to one, but generally yeah. across generally across my time, like if I think about when I left Patient Pop, I think we had you know forty inside salespeople and maybe, or excuse me, 30 inside salespeople and maybe 40 to 45, you know, BDRs. And so it was about a one to one and a half ratio. Cool. Um, you know, when it comes to hiring, I feel like that's always a struggle for founders, especially if you have maybe you're more like a, a founder, uh, sorry, product led founder. Um, mm-hmm. and you don't understand, you've never hired salespeople to for, before. Do you have any tips or suggestions to hire effective and, and maybe, you know, high, high quality sales performers. And then sure. also on top of that, do you have any tips on how to structure effective compensation plans? Because I think that's also tricky as well, right? Yeah. I think to start with effective sales hires, um, I'm really interested in like the intrinsics. So I care mostly about curiosity, coachability, positivity, like Give me someone like that and I can generally mold them into an effective salesperson. What I don't want is like, they've been through the ringer, they're no longer motivated, um, you know, um, uh, they have a Rolodex that they depend on and when that Rolodex is, is, is out, then they're out, right? Like those are all things that I worry about. Um, I don't care about logos because even Salesforce and Slack make crappy hires. You know, what I care about are those those soft skills that I talked about in the beginning. And then I always try and bring people in from the same velocity. So folks who understand transactional SaaS, if you bring, even if you take a healthcare technology salesperson who sells enterprise deals and you bring them into a high velocity environment, they're going to fail for the most part. Mm. They're going to be really surprised by the speed. Um, and then I think if you take an SMB person and put them into the enter- enterprise side of the business, they will often be very surprised by the complexity. And so I try and stick in my swim lane with velocity. And then I look to hire really talented, curious, exciting, um, coachable, you know, folks and give them the knowledge they need to, to be successful and, you know, flip that switch and watch them self-educate because that's what a lot of really great salespeople do. Makes sense. And then, you know, adding to that, do you have any tips on how to structure uh, yeah. the comp, comp plans uh, to keep them, keep them motivated more short term and long term? Definitely. So I am the reverse Robin Hood. So I like to rob bottom performers and pay top performers. So mm-hmm. that, that might not be a popular statement, but it's the best way, mm-hmm. in my opinion, to build a sales team. And here's what I mean by that. Most compensation plans are either flat structures, you earn a percentage of the deal, or you have a tiered structure where you start earning, you know, 2% and 5% and 8% on, on, on up until, you know, maybe you cap out around 20 or 25%. Right. Anytime, anytime that you pay somebody, um, a dollar on their very first dollar of revenue earned, or you pay them a percentage of that very first dollar, you are taking away from what you could pay someone who is overperforming. And so what I do is I have a cliff kind of like vesting in stock Mm -hmm. options, right? You have to essentially pay for yourself first. And then once you've done that, or once you've reached some threshold, right, I can ratchet the commission percentage up much higher. And that way I save money on the folks who are closing only 50% of their quota. I take that money and I give it to the people that are doing 120% of their quota because there's only a finite pool of cash to pay people in in commissions. And I'd rather pay top performers. It does two things for you. It allows bottom performers to self-select out and go find a place where their skills are more of a fit. And it keeps top performers feeling extraordinarily motivated and ready to keep crushing deals because they're at 20 or 25% TCV. Makes, makes perfect sense. Um, you know, in today's age with COVID, even pre-COVID, I've, I've, you know, we've managed a lot of SaaS companies who are all r- built remotely. And I found hiring sales reps remotely has been a challenge. How do you effectively manage sales teams who need that constant push and competition around them and somebody to, you know, give them that, that kind of constant uh, dopamine hit or, or, or yeah. you know, attention? <laughs> yeah, I haven't hired or managed remote sales teams. So I, I just okay. want to be pr- pretty clear about that because I left patient pop before, before COVID hit. Um, mm. There are two thoughts I have on it and these thoughts okay. may or may not be right. But the first thing is, if you've hired effectively, if you've hired those people that I talked about earlier who are curious, coachable, and positive, it makes it a lot easier to go remote because those people are self-motivated. For instance, when I was a salesperson, I worked in the field at ZocDoc. I never needed a manager because all I wanted to do was win. 
And so you didn't need to be standing over my shoulder to get me to do my job. And so those are the type of people that you want to hire. I think once you've hired those people, and again, this is an assumption because I haven't uh, uh, hired or managed, is, is have a really regular cadence with very specific action items. So for me, it would be every Monday, we know that we meet about this. Every Tuesday, we know that we go through pipeline. Every Wednesday, we know that we do unstuck deals. Every Thursday, we do this. Every Friday, we do this. And make it very, very rigid so that everyone understands the expectations of the week and that pretty soon it becomes a well-oiled assembly line of what you're actually doing out there. Those would be two things that I would think about if I were thrust back into the position of having to build a remote sales organization. It makes makes sense. I'll have to try that out. Um, wh- at what point do you think it makes sense and becomes critical to hiring a VP of sales? And what do you look for there? Because I've heard stories as well where you know enterprise sales where they've spent a lot of money because you know same thing. They hired somebody who worked at a big logo. He comes in, asks for a lot of money for travel for you know high commissions, and he doesn't deliver anything. Um, maybe if you can speak to that and what what people can look for to help there. Yeah, I, I'd say first of all, like. I am a fan of starting with the stretch hire. And maybe that's because that's kind of what I was, or maybe that's because I've seen that be successful in other businesses. But I don't want that person who has grown, whose last position was at a $100 million in recurring revenue startup. If you're at 3 million in recurring revenue, that was a long time ago in their lifetime. And they have not mm. seen that that chaos, that lack of process, that ability to roll up your sleeves and get down and dirty. If you built a sales organization to $100 million in recurring revenue, you're probably sitting pretty in your life. And <laughs> you don't really want to roll up your sleeves again. That's I'm painting with a broad brush. And that's not Fair always enough. true. But, mm. but that is probably more true than false. So the first thing that I would, I would recommend is that people look for the guy or the gal below the guy or gal that did it, right? So like, mm. for instance, if you were to look across my team at Patient Pop, you know, I was the, the leader of the sales organization, but directly below me, I had some really talented folks, Kevin Dorsey, Jess Strickland, Max Kim Brown. These are people who, you know, are going to get that opportunity at some point. And they, they will have had an opportunity to have a front row seat at watching that business grow they're still ready to prove themselves as a first-time executive hire. And I, that's the kind of person that I would want to hire if I were Smart. building a business. And so um, that, that would be how I might avoid um, that, that really expensive mistake. And, mm-hmm. and I would also pick somebody that comes from, again, a similar price point and velocity. If I'm hiring an SMB SaaS sales leader, I'm hiring someone from SMB SaaS every single time. Again, that velocity is going to really surprise them. So that's how I sort of think about it when I help my clients today. And what, one of the things that I do for most of my clients is place their executive team. Makes, makes, makes perfect sense. Um, and then, you know, another part of that, you mentioned this as, a, as, a, as something you had success with at Patient Pop, where you helped improve that conversion rate of SQLs. Um, I think that's one of the challenges as well that sales founders face. Um, so they want to convince their, their target their audience and who they're they're targeting, uh, that their solution is the best compared to their competitors. What are some suggested strategies or plans that you uh, work with to help improve that conversion rate? Yeah, I try and narrow focus. Mm. So uh, let me give you an example of why I say that, Akil. So I've, I've met with a few founders early on, and I'll say, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, your ideal customer profile? And a, a response that I often hear is, we're in a great position because we can sell to everyone. And to me, that sounds like a terrible position to be in. Not, not terrible, but like, what does that mean? How do you qualify someone when you can sell to anyone? And so what I, what I usually recommend is, is focus. And so let's take a subset of that entire universe and let's get that down to three pieces of criteria or four pieces of criteria that we yep. believe make the absolute best customer for our business, right? And then we start building some assumptions around that person. Where do they play online? What do they do at work? What makes them happy? What makes them upset? And we go out and we effectively target that one subset of ideal customer profile. When we bring them in, We move them through the sales cycle. And generally, you'll come out with a few things. You'll come out with closed lost, right? For multiple different reasons. And you'll come out with some closed ones, right? For multiple different reasons. And what I like to do is is trace commonalities. So I'll Mm. look back across all of the closed lost and say, what are the things that these closed lost deals have in common? Then let's take a look at the closed one. 
what are the things that these have in common? And then use that data to further validate how to qualify a lead. So maybe of these 20 deals that all closed, they were all within 20 miles of a major metropolitan area, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. That's going to be a qualification process moving forward. We're going to, we're going to ask that during the qualification process. And so that's what I do is I, I let the data tell me what, what leads to a win. And every time the data tells me something with a high degree of confidence, I reinstall it into my qualification process. Mm. And, you know, that's specifically for a B2B, you know, probably B2B SaaS. Um, and you all, you're also an expert on, on personal branding. And you're adding to what the last thing we talked about, you know, you're either a jack of all trades is the master of none, which is, I think, going back to needing to focus on who you want to target. Is, is there any difference? How do you position like from a personal brand perspective? Um, this is the same thing where you let people know how and why you're good in certain fields and in industry without overwhelming and offering them too much. Is it just, you know, same thing, target focus on your personal brand? Yeah, yeah, it is. I, I, I do believe that. I don't know if I'm an expert, but you know, I, I definitely spend a lot of time um, building my brand online and, and mm-hmm. offline and helping people do the same and helping businesses do the same. And I, again, I'd rather be the best at something small than be average at something in a much larger pool. So this kind of ties back to your earlier question when, where you said, yeah, you could focus on ed tech, you could focus on fintech. I could, and there would be ed tech and fintech SVPs of sales and CROs who would be better than I than I am. And I, nice. I say I say this, and I don't and I don't mean this to come off as arrogant. It's certainly not intended to come off that way. But I feel like I am, you know, one of the top performers from an executive sales level in my very small niche. And so mm-hmm. that's why I niche both my business, but also my brand, because ultimately business is an outcome of brand. And if I focus my brand on that and other folks focus their brand on a small niche, they can build a business around that. And so I think those two things are actually quite similar. Mm. And on the marketing side of that, you know, personal versus business, have you seen any differences when it comes to how to best market it and which channels to leverage uh, and, you know, what kind of content you created? Yeah. I mean, I, I have a strong opinion that you should never market on behalf of your company because, you know, when you get fired, is your company going to build your personal brand for you? The answer is no. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so um, I am, I'm a big fan of taking control of my own life and not allowing my business to creep into my, my online persona and my social personas. Um, mm. But if, you, if that's the directive um, from the business, then you can look at some companies like Gravy doing it really well. And they're using you know, LinkedIn as their platform. And they're mm-hmm. a small, they were a small SaaS business that's growing really fast because their CEO has their team online frequently. And that's where their customers play. So the answer is, where do your customers play? Like I could have had all of the uh, salespeople at Patient Pop building brands on LinkedIn or Twitter. It wouldn't have mattered because doctors aren't there. They don't care. And so um, that would have been the wrong place to play, right? But if you have a B2B business where your buyers are on a social platform, like in my opinion, the ambassador, the teams that have built big ambassadors, look at Outreach, look at Gong, look again, look at Gravy. They're all over uh, you know, uh, the social media channels and gongs beating their competition, outreach beating yeah. their competition. Why? They've got ambassadors all over the place. And I think that's a huge strategy in 2021. Hmm. And then when you're setting your goals and objectives for, you know, a brand versus the, the personal is, uh, in the company versus the, the personal, do you have any differences in how you set your goals and KPIs there? Or so can you share any tips on what you would do? Yeah, I don't have a lot of experience in building like big social distribution for companies because of the reason that I shared earlier, which is our 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 user, our customer is just not there. Um, mm. Anecdotally, um, what I can tell you is that <clears throat> there are lots of members of my sales team that found a LinkedIn direct message to be as effective as a text message, and I thought that was a really unique learning. It's really mm. hard to automate that. LinkedIn doesn't have a lot of automation for for sales teams, um, especially when your buyer isn't that popular on their platform. But when I'm measuring personally, I mean, people talk a lot about vanity metrics, which there are, of course, but you know, likes and views and engagement and things like that is a leading indicator of of the outcome, um, typically, not always. And then what I look for is cash, like my business is built on the backs of social media. Uh, Everything that I know about business, I promote pretty actively on social media. 
And so when founders come into my ecosystem, book discovery calls, you know, sign up for my, my advising service, that is the, the gold bar in the bank. That's what tells me whether or not I'm doing a good job. And you know, so far over the last 16 months, I've had a full clientele since the day I started. And so I'm going to keep going until that channel doesn't work anymore. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and you, know, you talked about one of the CEOs when he moved to New York as somebody you, know, you looked up to, you got to work underneath him. Um, obviously, you, you have some great success who would you say are other, you know, maybe three mentors and or resources books who you would say have been instrumental to your success and helped you grow along the way in the last, you know, 10 plus years? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'd say the first person was Cyrus Masumi. He was the founder mm-hmm. of ZocDoc and the CEO. And he hired me and invested in me and gave me all sorts of responsibility and really pushed me and really was... Um, he really pushed me. And I just appreciated that. He kind of unlocked something that I didn't know that I had and I will be forever grateful and we still have a great relationship. And um, so that, that's definitely one person. I would say another is Jason Lemkin. I met Jason, the founder of Saster, early on um, in my tenure at Patient Pop when I was just a flailing executive trying to figure it out. And he took an interest in me when he didn't have to. And he, you know, brought me to Saster to speak a few times and has forged a really great relationship. And he's just a wealth of knowledge. I remember spending maybe five minutes with him chatting and he solved a problem for me. I was like, oh, that was really mm-hmm. helpful. And then, um, you know, maybe last but not least is the, the team over at Toba Capital who invested in Patient Pop, um, specifically Patrick Mathiasen is a, uh, he's a VC at, at, to- at Toba. And I, I, I recall when they invested in the business, um, having this stigma around VC executive relationships, you see it on TV. What did I expect? Like I expected to walk into a room and get screamed at, right? That that was how I envisioned my first board meeting, even though I was doing a good job. That's what I pictured in my head. And, you know, Patrick took a real interest in my work, in my personality, in investing in my success. He's a great listener. Um, so Patrick uh, Mathiasen at Toba was another. So yeah, th- those are my three. Awesome. Love it. Yeah, Jason is great. I, I know uh, what he's built and continue to build. I think it's it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, Justin, today, after you know all, all these years of success, what does success mean to you today? It means, this is going to be a strange answer, um, <laughs> but it means being able to do what I want, when I want, where I want. Um, I believe that separating hours from income is really important in living a, a really great life. And so um, what I'm trying to do is build a business that allows me to earn a living, um, add, make a huge impact on my clients, um, reduce my overall workload, and spend a lot of time with my family. And so to me, that is what success looks at looks like. I'm not a monetary guy. I don't have a monetary goal. Um, okay. I just want to be able to spend time with, with my family and do things that I enjoy. That's a, that's a very good answer. And it uh, sounds like freedom and flexibility, which I think is the ultimate form of success. I agree with that. Right. Um, so, yeah. Awesome, Justin. Thank you so much for joining us today. How can our audience get in touch with you, learn more about your, your consulting services, or maybe get assistance on accelerating their, their own sales uh, for their SaaS company? Yeah, totally. The, the best place to go is my website, which is scale.healthcare. Scale.healthcare. Perfect. We'll put the, put the links to all those on our show notes so people can check that out. Thanks again, Justin. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Nikhil, thanks so much for having me, man. Appreciate it. (laughs) Cheers. Thank you all for watching this episode and joining SAS District today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for future episodes where we interview top leaders in the SAS industry. If you're a SAS company looking to grow and unlock the true value of your business, get in touch with us at Horizon Capital and myself or one of our consultants will provide a free assessment to help you get there and hit your goals. If you have any feedback or suggestions for this podcast, please comment down below and help us improve our content for you all. Thanks again and see you on the next one.